Hey everybody, welcome to DTNS Experiment Week. All this week, DTNS is on vacation, summer vacation. So we handed over the feed to our friends to try some stuff out. Each of them has an experimental podcast idea that they'd like your feedback on. So please send us your feedback, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com or leave your feedback at patreon.com slash DTNS. We'll pass it along to them. And remember, each one of these is their podcast, so they are responsible for the content, but we hope you enjoy it and we'll see you soon this week on it sparkcast extreme gets intel from intel esxi's adcve means you better update pdq and the uk says okay to hpe buying juniper Greetings and welcome to IT Sparkcast. I'm your host, John Barger. Hi, and I'm Lou Schmidt, aka the other guy, your code host. We've been around this stuff for a while, so let's get to it. It's Thursday, August 8th. IT Sparkcast is a digest of the IT news over the last week with insights, opinions, and a little sarcasm from two experts, each with over 20 years of experience working in IT or for IT vendors. And now for the news bites. According to a press release, Extreme Networks announced that it's formed a co-innovation alliance with the Intel Connectivity Analytics Program. This is going to allow them to enhance their native AI capabilities within their Extreme AI expert solution. Uh, some for full disclosure for everybody, both Lou and I used to work for Extreme Networks, so just putting that out there so there's no conflict of interest here. Uh, so the Extreme AI expert is a, is a generative AI tool that allows a user to find information quickly, technical information that might be buried in various different repositories that Extreme has. They have got, they've got a knowledge base. They've got a bunch of different areas you can go to find documentation or how to's and things like that. Many vendors are doing this with Gen AI now. So that's par for the course. You type in a problem, the answer is returned. You don't need to know the exact keywords that uh, are required like you would with a standard search. This partnership with Intel and its connectivity analytics program is providing additional content about clients and other devices that will be on the network that will help those extreme users um, without having to search the, just the extreme database. So I have a question about this. Is this the melding of Intel's internal documentation? Is this a documentation play? Or is this a projection of the vPro data that they collect off enterprise class laptops and servers? The great question. And, and it's still early days to, uh, figuring that out. I think it's actually both, uh, but we'll have to see as this progresses and what happens with Extreme's AI expert tool. Um, I will say that when I went to the, the Intel site for the uh, connectivity analytics program API, mouthful there, uh, that there are other vendors already using this. Cisco's already using it in a similar way. So this is, again, just kind of par for the course, adding more data into an, an existing tool that's really going to help out those extreme customers. So, yeah, this, this could have a lot of potential. I've seen a lot of vendors try to tackle this space uh, before. And uh, this, you know, let's go ahead and address this a little more down in the next point. There you go. Why don't you jump right into it? Absolutely. So uh, this is a, a, a really interesting point, uh, courtesy of our friends at InfoWorld. Your messy data is holding enterprises back from AI. Now, obviously, we're going to talk a lot about AI on this uh, podcast, not because we love AI, but because it is the Godzilla in our Tokyo, right? It's coming through and it's getting everything and uh, there's a lot of hype around it. So, so we're, we all see the potential of it, but we're seeing a lot of rocks in the past. And according to these folks, uh, basically they're saying that your messy data, the data formatting, where you have it, how to identify it, and what is the cleanliness of that data is yet another load being dumped on your poor CIO to try to make this stuff work. Now, my comment on this would be, 
many of us have looked at the coming AI re revolution as our opportunity to take this disordered data and apply some data order to it. Maybe that's not going to be the way it goes. John, what do you think? Well, it reminds me, you know, back when I was in, in university, uh, the old saying of garbage in, garbage out. And I think that's still true today. Large language models are just, they learn what they're given. And, and we've seen this in the, in the hallucinations of the standard chatbots that we're seeing out there. We're going to see that if bad data is passed into these tools. Well, you know, that's a, that's a really good point. And actually, that also brings you on to our next tech bite. Good point, Lou. Um, and so what I've seen in, in an article in TechCrunch, uh, Rob Mee, who was previously the CEO of Pivotal, has founded a new startup called Mechanical Orchard. Now, Mechanical Orchard is going to help companies with their digital transformation efforts. So digital transformation is this critical but difficult task that all organizations are eventually going to uh, face. That's if you think about back in the day, moving from calculators and ledger books to a to spreadsheets was a digital transformation that accounting and bookkeepers had to go through. Today, corporations are using uh, moving their tools from on prem to cloud and using AI and other advanced capabilities. Now, what if you have an old legacy application? Um, and these tools that were written years ago, and you've been using it and your company is really dependent on it. Digital transformation can be a daunting task and even prohibitive from taking things down, understanding how the code is written, if it was written long enough ago that some of the people still aren't there. And that's where Mechanical Orchard is going to come in. Uh, they're using AI enhanced tools and cloud instances to build modernized copies of these legacy apps and services that companies already have. Wow, that's really interesting. You know, a couple of thoughts right off the top of my head. One, I hope they've got some old COBOL, COBOL guys stuffed in the back uh, because we ran into this in Y2K and that code is really never gone away. The second thing, that I wonder if these folks are going to do, many organizations have no idea where all their information is or where they're pulling it from. There's little pockets and silos of, of knowledge that are lost over time. It does make me wonder if it's possible for these folks to actually tell you how you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and to speak to COBOL, you know, when I was in uh, in university, I aced every single technical class I took, whether it was programming languages or databases, except for COBOL. COBOL was the one class I got a D in because I just couldn't stand working on that. So I got a lot of respect for all those guys back in the Y2K days that did all that work and they earned the money that they made. So in this case, what Mechanical Orchard is doing is it's a combination of AI and cloud instances and human consultation, where they're going to help you do a full transformation. It's not just turning it over to an AI, to an uh, LLM, and saying, go make a new version of this app. It is involving experts, humans that know the, the, the source code and the type of code that's being used, the type of tools, the outcome that's expected, and so forth. It's just using AI and, um, and cloud instances to uh, to move that along as it was one of the tools. They're not the only company doing something like this, but it seems like they've they've hit on something. Uh, so for example, Alphabet's GV, which is used to be uh, Google Ventures, they think it's a good idea. They're leading an unsolicited $50 million Series B round of funding. That's gonna make the total round of funding for, for A and B to be $74 million. I think that that means that they see some legs here. They think that this is really going to work out. That's not a small bet. One of the questions I would ask is, is Mechanical Orchard's model to provide a in-house professional services wing that will do this? Or are they going to build the tool that's going to enable uh, HPE and, and Cisco and IBM to go out there and do this with enterprises? 
Good question. My take on it is, is they want to be the, um, the, the main source. They want to be providing the people and the resources, but it is possible that they could scale out by going with somebody like, uh, like an IBM or somebody like that. Hmm. But with that, let's move on to our main stories. So we've already talked quite a bit about AI and IT, um, but that's going to lead to a whole new set of models and a lot of new things, including training your workforce. So, Lou, what do you got on that? Well, something just crossed my path here um, from the lovely folks over at Computer World uh, recently, and uh, they had an article talking about uh, why you need to train the AI-enabled workforce. Now, when I initially looked at this, I thought, okay, is this the type of training that we talk about end user training? How do you effectively use the AI? That's going to have to happen. But this is actually talking about how do you train your organization to structure itself such that it can take advantage of this. And, and you know, at the beginning of this year, 87% of the 200 companies surveyed by Bain and Company said they were already developing, piloting, or had deployed Gen AI in some capacity. Um, most of the early rollouts involve tools for software code development. We're seeing a lot of activity in there. Uh, customer service, marketing and sales, and product differentiation. So that's really great. We've got these early adopters going out there. Uh, what you can take away from this is that we, IT professionals, we're all looking at it. It's sucking up a lot of resources, right, is the second thing. It's causing us to shift folks from other roles over to this function, or we've had to lay people off and hire new people, which is expensive because there's not a lot. Of, it's like hiring a web expert at the beginning of the World Wide Web. It was really difficult to get these people. Um, this, but the challenge is the stuff that the folks were doing that you either cross-trained or replaced did not go away. AI was supposed to remove that, but it hasn't. Not yet. We don't know enough yet. And we're not at the point where that AI can replace those folks. Yeah. So I was just thinking, you and I both have a significant background in training as well as IT. Um, so like, and I see this as a, as a, as a shift, a monumental shift as everybody's aware, that's not new information. Um, but shifting in general is really difficult for any organization. So, uh, and when you talk about something this substantive, that, that some, something that's so massive that's going on right now is this kind of AI revolution. What's the recommendation? What do we do to move forward here? That's great. Uh, well, they do have, um, you know, one of the observations that was pointed out by these by this article was that even if you banned AI in your organization, which many organizations are certainly looking at, we've seen uh, some, for example, some pushback about AI being included into vendor operating systems that could potentially compromise your uh, proprietary data. The problem is users are doing it anyway, right? They're out there, they're doing this thing. Uh, now the, the challenge is uh, one uh, Gardner senior director uh, mentioned that they would they were recommending taking it slow, not upscaling, uh, upscaling workers in Gen AI until they had specific use cases, but because this individual sees workers using Gen AI behind the scenes, uh, even at organizations that have, have banned it, you've got to take a different approach. John? Yeah, so I mean, this is the, the classic conundrum that of any IT organization of shadow IT. If you're not providing a service that I want, I'm going to find it on my own. So banning anything is never going to work. You can't ban smartphones. You can't ban personal devices. You can't ban AI. It's just not going to work. So what do we do? Well, one of the things you can do is assemble a team, and this is what they're recommending. This is what the specific training at this stage it is about, is how do you put to a gen AI, getting an AI team together? 
right? You're going to need a data scientist. Um, and that's a really uh, very uh, heavy title, but really you're looking at input formatting and bounds checking. Is the data going in correct, uh, correctly? An AI software engineer that can build you models, customize models, check and make sure that the software is not accessing anything um, it shouldn't. That's going to be really important. A new C-suite chair will probably come out of this, which would be a chief AI officer. How do you set policy in something that the business model is driving, but the business decision makers don't truly understand? We've been through this before, which was the rise of the CSO and chief security officer, and adjunct to that, the chief privacy officer. Um, AI security, this one is going to be fun, in my opinion, because what does that mean, right? Does it mean we're protecting an application? Okay, we've been doing that for years. We know how to protect applications. I think this is Lou's personal opinion, based on what I've seen with other technologies, that we're going to see new types of attacks, mimetic attacks, where you're going in and you're trying to mess up the linkage of the information inside the model, which is very, very challenging to configure. Uh, if somebody trips you correctly mimetically, you got a problem. Um, and there's going to be an awful lot of activity around that. Uh, prompt engineering, how do you ask the right questions? Uh, you know, prior to this to, to this recording session, John and I were talking about the difference between asking questions of a search engine and asking questions of a Gen AI and how it reduced or eliminated the requirements for keywords. But sometimes if you really want to drill down, you've got to know how to ask the right question. And the last thing is legal. Yes, somebody's going to get sued over this. So we're already we seeing that people are getting sued left and right with with uh, large language models today. That is true. And so organizations, before we can even get to the point of training organizations on what they need to do with their their end user AI, we don't even have a structure inside these orgs, and a lot of orgs don't know they need it. That's what I think the the thrust of this is, and I think it's a good I think it's a good idea. And folks, you should be thinking about this. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I, I love the analogy you made of the rise of the chief security officer and the uh, uh, and all those other C suites, and that's really going to be what's required here. And then that person will have to take lead in the organization to make sure that they're using AI properly and efficiently and not again allowing shadow IT to come over because that data protection is going to go away if you're using if I'm just using chat GPT for all my you know sensitive corporate work uh, without going through the proper channels. So I, I love I love that part of the uh, this topic. You know there is one point that I didn't bring up that I had pondered earlier. And this exactly. is going to play in majorly, and it wasn't listed out in this, but I think it would be a good addition. Most of us are subject to ISO certification. What is this going to do to your ISO certification? No, I don't know that anybody has really answered that question yet. So you know, that, that's a great point, and it's something I hadn't thought of either. And as somebody who's had to go through the rigors of ISO certs for various um, applications and tools that I was responsible for. Um, that's going to get really, really interesting. And I think that that's an area that many companies are just not prepared for today. I think we're going to both be back talking about this one in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll but you, um, you had an interesting point for the next one. Would you like to uh, talk about some big movements going on? Yeah, so I mean, we're all aware of of Hewlett Packard Enterprises' uh, desire to acquire Juniper, and it's going through its regulatory processes. Uh, a little while ago, the European Union approved it, and now the the UK's Compensation and Markets Authority Act has approved 
uh, the acquisition. So this is one of the, the, the last steps. There's still a few more to go through, but they're getting there. And it looks more and more like it absolutely will happen. And there wasn't much doubt in it, but this was just one of those steps that had to get through. And we've seen recently the UK um, Compliance and Marks Authority, the CMA, you know, put the the hold on a few items, the, the acquisition uh, from Microsoft recently um, of Activision and things like that, where they they were you know putting it on the brakes, but then they got through it and everything is working out. So that's what's going on here. I think that this is going to be a really interesting shift in the uh, the network infrastructure uh, core market when these two medium sized uh, companies come together and form what's probably the biggest challenger to a Cisco that's really ever been out there. You know, it used to be uh, that we would refer to Cisco and everybody else as the as the other little guys. And now I think you're going to see that this is a really big, um, a big shift in the market. The question then comes out is if you're an existing customer of HPE Enterprise slash Aruba, or you or from Juniper Mist, how much um, concern do you have about the tools that you're using today, and are they going to be here in two years? You know that's an interesting point. Uh, I look at it from so full disclosure. I have worked for Juniper, uh, so I have more than a passing acquaintance with what they have and how they do it, and I have friends. Who uh, who did the mist acquisition? Uh, the the challenge that I see is the big overlap in this is the Aruba mist overlap. Everything else, whether you're looking at servers, when you're looking at security, um, when you're looking at sort of the big iron stuff on the networking side, that's clearly there's no no real conflict there. Uh, Juniper is going to have the bigger routers and and higher scale and a lot. Where you're going to see the friction, I think is in the enterprise desktop space and possibly in the data center. Although personally, I think that's going to lean more towards Juniper, but that's going yeah. to depend on how the tools go. Now, the question I have is, while we live in sort of a tripolar cloud where we have HPE, Juniper, whatever they're going to call that, You've got Cisco, which is, seems to be rapidly getting out of the networking business. That's just the way I've been reading it. I don't know how you folks are on it. And then you have this cloud of a whole bunch of other smaller players. Are we going to see consolidation amongst those smaller players? What do you think, John? Yeah, I think I think you're you're going to see that happen. I mean, I I know you know looking at some of these companies and their market caps. If you had asked me two years ago you know, how much of that kind of uh, consolidation would you see? I would have said, you know, these companies are now worth two, three, four, five, six billion dollars. And that's not an, you know, it's not an easy case to make, to make those acquisitions. But I mean, this, this acquisition of Juniper is a $14 billion deal. I think that you might start seeing more and more acquisitions and, and, more consolidations. Maybe you'll find like a firewall company, so call it a Palo Alto, that doesn't really have much in the way of, of LAN enterprise uh, switching and wireless, but they're going up against the Ford today. So maybe they're going to need to to uh, increase their portfolio in order to compete better against Ford today. Maybe they don't. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe it's a it's something more. Um, more out there that we hadn't considered that would come in and make some acquisitions and see what's going on there. You know, a consideration that I have looking at all this as well as we all started to work from home during our last pandemic. Uh, the echoes of that are still going through our system. If you've been watching commercial real estate at all, this is one thing I pay attention to because if you're going to go after the traditional IT vendors we think about, Go after carpeted enterprise. And uh, you know, your enterprise locations, there are very few areas where that's growing, and a lot of areas where the bottom is falling out of the market. So where is the next growth? Simultaneously, we're seeing uh large cloud scale challenges, whether it's cost or a software problem or an attack. Folks are starting to rethink how much they want to have in the cloud. 
So the new IT landscape, John, to your point, might be completely different. It might be. I think there's a lot for us to dig into, and, and maybe in a future episode, we'll d dig in deeper um, as to what's going to happen with this, this acquisition. But I think it's time for us to move on to our one of our regular segments, the CVE of the week. The common vulnerability and exploits. And we have a tasty one for you this week, because anything that says VMware on it, all of us are going to pay attention to. So let me walk you through the, what the announcement was on this earlier. This is a, a relatively new one. Uh, what we're talking about is CVE-2024-37085. Uh, which is a vulnerability that allows you to use Active Directory to completely annihilate your ESXi complex. Now, maybe some people wouldn't say it that way, but we're going to be honest here. So here's what happened, right? Um, what, how this bug works is that if you can get into Active Directory as a privileged enough user that can create a group, and you create a group called ESXi admin. Even if that group doesn't exist, or if that group exists, you add yourself to it. Then um, ESXi does not have any security protocols in place to check what's going on with the ESXi admins. If it sees that group and you're confederated with Active Directory, boom, you're in. At that point, and, and mind you, this is ESXi, not vCenter, right? So you're going directly to the virtual machine hosts. As Soon as you start grabbing those hosts, you're gonna start horizontally going through this. Um, now you can encrypt those, destroy them, whatever you wanna do. A lot of talk about this uh, this week. There's some interesting side notes to this. John, you know, what do you think about this? So it's interesting. My understanding is you have to compromise a host that already has enough permissions to do something in Active Directory or compromise a user and jump into that Active Directory. So, I mean, that that's, it sounds like to some degree, it's a small uh, footprint for, for the attack vector, but we all know that sometimes these things blow up. So you want to wager on who's the first OS that's going to be the main attack vector is going to be? Well, I don't think we have to wager that much because this bug was uncovered by Microsoft's team, which did a really good job of analyzing it and breaking it down. The initial vector in there is something called QuackBot, which has been around since 2008. So essentially what you're going to do is hit somebody up with a phishing link or a malicious document, get QuackBot in there, start moving horizontally through the network until you can compromise somebody with enough uh, credentials to get at this. And then, then you can execute this attack, which is probably why folks aren't screaming about this more. Uh, because one, if you're not confederating your identity into Active Directory, and I uh, allow me to, to sort of extrapolate that a bit, does that mean Azure as well? Based on what I've read with this, I believe it does. Um, however, I would love for some user to come and correct that. By all means, we want to hear your feedback on this stuff. But I did some research. Once you add ESX admin, that is the key part. It's a default group in ESXi. Now, this has been patched. If you're running the latest patch level, came out at the end of last month, you have the patch. But the challenge is this has been actively exploited. And it's been exploited for some time. As far as we know, this one's been out there for a while. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can block that group from being created. Obviously, you want to also patch your software. Um, but I would probably lock that group out if you, if you could, just to make sure for safety. Uh, another way that these folks have been getting into it is they'll get enough domain responsibility to control like one group and then they rename the group that's a nasty one right go in yeah. rename the group and go and then um even if the network administrator assigns any other group in the domain to be managed management group from esxi hypervisor the full 
admin privileges of EXI admins are not immediately removed. Threat actors could still. So you got to lock that group down and, and do your patching. But even if a vendor says, yeah, we've patched that, paranoia is key. So here's the question. If you've already compromised, is patching enough or do you actually have to go take additional remedial action? I would recommend a complete reload at that juncture. I mean, you. Yeah. the problem is, is that once they've trojaned in something, they bring in so many other kits with them. These off-the-shelf compromise systems, uh, Microsoft's right up on it, does detail some of what they've seen, how it's attaching itself to the processes. So I would recommend following that CVE back to Microsoft and taking a look at um, and how they're doing it. Um, but the, the challenge with the type of exploit this is, is that the Quackbot is only in the first kit that comes in, right? While it's exploiting your ES ESXi servers, it's probably going after everything else you've got. So this is, uh, you know, the real problem is you were exploited. Right. The backup problem is the isolation you thought you had in your virtual machine infrastructure, it got nuked. There you go. That's that's the big one. Yeah. So that's why we talk about this stuff. Thanks, Lou. That was great information, and it's something that we all need to know about. And that wraps our inaugural episode of IT SparkCast. Special thanks to Tom and Roger from Daily Tech News Show. Without their inspiration and help, this podcast would not have happened. Let us know if there are other topics you want to hear from us in future episodes. Feedback at ITSparkCast.com. And just as a note, that is I-T-S-P-A-R-C-C-A-S-T.com. We're also at IT SparkCast on X and on YouTube. So please check us out there. Going forward, you can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts and watch us on YouTube. We'll see you next week. That's it for Experiment Week. Let us know what you think about what you've heard. Send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We will be back with our normal DTNS schedule on Monday with Shannon Morse. Talk to you then.